Having epilepsy surgery is a complicated decision for a family, and one that they enter only after careful consideration of the treatment options. In addition, the medical team meets as the Pediatric Comprehensive Epilepsy Center in a conference that consists of the entire medical team involved in the patient's care. This would be neurosurgeons, epileptologists, neuroradiologists, all to review the patient's information to make sure that this patient is optimal for surgery. We will now be giving you an inside look directly into the operating room, where Drs. Greenfield and Schwartz will be taking you on a step-by-step -step basis through the pediatric epilepsy surgery on this young patient. My name is Dr. Theodore Schwartz, and I'm the Director of Epilepsy Surgery at Weill Cornell Medical College, New York Presbyterian Hospital. On my left is Dr. Jeffrey Greenfield, the Director of Pediatric Epilepsy Surgery. And we're going to talk to you today about an epilepsy surgery case that we're about to do and show you the case to try to uh, teach you a little bit about how we do epilepsy surgery here at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Today we're going to be performing surgery on a 12-year-old girl with intractable epilepsy. What that means is that she has seizures that can't be totally controlled with medications. And once we really got at the bottom of where her seizures are coming from uh, via something called an EEG where we localize the seizures just through her scalp electrodes, we recognized that her seizures were all coming from one area of her brain near her right frontal lobe. And when you have an area of epilepsy that is uh, so safe and so superficial, there is a uh, fairly good chance that uh, resective surgery can offer some type of palliation or cure even to patients with epilepsy. Uh, as Dr. Greenfield mentioned, we know the seizures are coming from the right frontal lobe, which is this part of the brain. But we don't know exactly where in the right frontal lobe the seizures are coming from. So what we need to do is more precisely pinpoint exactly the location of where the seizures are coming from so that we can remove that part of the brain and hopefully cure her of her seizures. So what we're going to do today is we're going to open up the bone of the skull over the right frontal lobe and we're going to place a grid of electrodes over the frontal lobe. And with that grid of electrodes, we'll be able to record from multiple contacts of the brain. And then we'll close up the head We'll bring her back to the floor and wait for her to have a couple of seizures. And when she has those seizures, we'll be able to record the electrical site of onset of the seizures with the electrodes we implant in her brain and then take her back to the operating room for a second surgery where we can remove that part of the brain that's abnormal, uh, which is the onset site for her seizures to try to stop her seizures completely. The electrodes that we're going to put in today will also allow us to map her brain. We can stimulate those electrodes, find out where the part of the brain is that moves her left arm and her left leg to make sure that there's a safe margin between those zones and the area where we're doing our surgery to make sure we don't hurt her at all in doing the surgery. So we're just opening up the dura to expose the brain. The frontal lobe is the largest lobe of the brain, so we have to expose quite a bit in this procedure. That's good. Okay, that's fine. Pick up a teeth and a stitch. Four out of me. Yeah. So we have an intraoperative navigation system that's like a GPS that lets us know where we are at all times. and. We determined beforehand on the imaging where we thought the motor area of the brain is that moves the left hand. And you can see where that is on the navigation. We're pointing right to that area. So we know we need to get our grids back to this point here in order to get adequate coverage of the frontal lobe to map out the motor strip. So that's about how far back we need to go. So we have to place some strip electrodes between the two hemispheres. And then it's going to stop when it hits the, uh, the corpus callosum. So Dr. Greenfield and I have placed five strips. Uh, and the reason we use strips first is that they're going between the hemispheres of the brain. And we want to sample all parts of the right frontal lobe. And in placing these strips around the brain, we've managed to push them between the two hemispheres so we can record from the medial part of the frontal lobes. 
The next step is going to be to put big grids on top of the frontal lobe to record from the surface area. So we're going to start doing that now. Kind of float it in. What we've done here is we've placed electrode grids over the surface of the frontal lobe back from the motor strip all the way forward to the tip of the frontal lobe. So we have very comprehensive coverage of her whole right frontal lobe. And if she's having a seizure from anywhere in the frontal lobe, we should be able to tell because we'll see which of these electrodes it's coming from. So we have two grids, small grid in front, a bigger grid in back. And we're going to hook them up now to uh, a computer and an amplifier to do some recordings. I'm Dr. Julianne Palicki. I'm the pediatric epileptologist who assists in the case in order to read the neurophysiology uh, during the case and assist with the uh, placement of the electrodes uh, during the case as well. I'll also be reading the studies when uh, the patient goes out of the operating room and we continue to map the seizures and do the motor mapping. After the placement of the grids, um, we do a very loose sketch uh, based on where Dr. Schwartz and Greenfield uh, put the electrodes, but then we have a computerized map where we co do consultation with the surgeon himself in order to align the grids um, where we had placed them uh, in the operating room. We have a, a mock-up drawings of the grids. We can align them where we knew we placed them. This way there's no miscommunication about where they were, how they were aligned, where they're set up in the brain as well. Okay, so what we were able to do is, again, while the surgeons were placing the grids, we were keeping track of where all of them were going, we have multiple double checks to make sure they're all in the right place. And then we do this recording right afterwards. When we see epileptiform activity, we go back and double check where it's coming from. What we confirmed both with the techs and with the neurosurgeons are that most of the activity was coming from the subfrontal uh, region of the brain, the anterior frontal region in an in a, in a hemispheric uh, region. Uh, what's really great is both of those strips are contiguous, so we're picking up just one area of activity. The other area we're seeing on the grids is projected activity, not primary activity. We don't see spikes from there, but we see a projection of their activity. The other thing that makes us very excited is that fits exactly with what her seizures look like when we see them. In other words, seizures from this region um, patients wake up at night, hers always occur at night, they are, she, you appear very fearful, um, you express a great deal of fear, you thrash around the bed, um, there's no uh, specific motor jerking activity like you'd think in most type of seizures. In fact, these kinds of seizures are often frequently misdiagnosed as night tears or other kinds of events. The other thing that we're very excited about is that this area of the brain can be very easily resected and with almost no deficits because the other side of the frontal lobe from the uh, left frontal region can really uh, take over most of this, those functions. You are bilaterally innervated, if you will, from the brain for those functions. So from what we're seeing now, A, we think we're in the right location, B, it fits with what we've seen on her previous monitoring, C, it fits with her type of seizures, and D, we're very far away from the motor region. We think we'll be able to do a complete and thorough resection. So this has gone um, just excellently so far, and I think we have uh, really good um, data in order to proceed. So now that we've established pretty conclusively that we've got good connection between our electrodes and the brain, and we've even gotten some added additional information that we might even have a good idea where the seizures are coming from. We still want to be able to monitor her when she goes to the ICU. And so we've got to be able to continue all of this connection between the brain and the monitoring equipment. And so we actually have to tunnel out all these electrodes through that dura, that thick membrane that we open to get to the brain, and then through the skull and then through the scalp. And it's obviously critically important that we do this in a very specific way first so as not to disrupt the connection between the electrodes and the brain so that once we know that we have an electrode that's actually picking up 
an epileptic discharge that we can feel very confident that we know where on the brain that's coming from. The second is that we're going to have a communication between the brain and the outside world through all these electrodes. And so we need to make it as watertight so that we don't have any possible leakage of fluid out from the brain through the scalp to minimize any possible complications postoperatively like infections. So this is a little bit of the tedious part of the case, but uh, extremely important once, once we've gotten a good connection. So now all of the electrodes which we were doing the monitoring from during the intraoperative portion of the case, they've all now been secured down to the dura, which is this covering again of the brain. And the dura has been closed, so some of the electrodes are coming out between the leaflets of the dura, where the dura was opened by us. And in some areas are actually coming out directly through the dura, which we made little stab holes using a trocar. So they're all coming out in this sort of radial array here. Um, and the dura is, is fairly watertight. We're going to put a sealant on here to prevent any CSF or brain fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, from leaking out. We'll put that on right now. And then we'll replace the skull in a loose fashion so that these electrodes can then come out. And then once she's back in the ICU, be secured again to the monitoring equipment. So now we're going to put the skull back on top of all the electrodes in the drain, which we've put in there to drain out any fluid that may accumulate over the next couple of weeks. And so we lose it, leave this loosely here. That allows us for a little bit of movement because the grids obviously add a little bit of volume to what's normally inside the intracranial compartment. So if we were to make it too tight, you can create a pressure problem and a phenomenon that we don't want to create while we're trying to get optimal recording postoperatively. So instead of actually screwing these in, we just leave it floating there. And then when we come back and do our definitive surgery, we'll of course reaffix the skull with these titanium plates so that her skull will fuse and be totally normal. Comes up there, comes up here. So I think we have a great opportunity to really help this little girl since all of her seizures were coming from one area, although uh, sort of a diffuse multifocal area, but one area of the brain, we should be able to resect that whole area and really try to stop or significantly improve her seizure frequency. So it's always good to go into the OR with a hopeful feeling like you're really going to help someone. So we're going to stimulate at 4 milliamps and we are going to watch her hand. Okay, now this could cause a seizure. Just letting everybody know. All right, so let's go on. Oh, anything? Uh, let's go up a little bit. Eight. The good news is. Her hand will be fine. Good. On. Off. So, just to summarize, what Dr. Greenfield and I determined with the help of Dr. Prine, the neuropsychologist, and the, uh, I would leave that, actually. You know, Dr. Palici was that the uh, motor area the part of the brain that moves her left hand is here. And we confirmed that. This is the part of the brain that moves the left hand. We confirmed that in the operating room by stimulating the hand and recording, and also by stimulating this part of the brain and seeing that her hand moved. So we know that there's a safe margin between the part of the brain that moves the hand and the part of the brain that causes the seizure, but it's very close. It's only about a centimeter away. So we have to be very careful, but in brain space, a centimeter is a lot of space. And so that gives us enough room to do the surgery safely. So we're going to proceed with our uh, surgical resection. So we're removing the uh, right frontal lobe, the source of her seizures. Uh, Dr. Lang, you want to help us? Grab it. Okay, here we go. Dr. Greenfield has it in his hand. So that is the majority of the right frontal lobe, although not all of it. So this was the right frontal lobe. 
this is the part of the brain that moves the left side of her body, which we've left in place. Coming down here, the part of the brain that uh, moves the left side of her face that we left in place. And then we've resected everything in front of that. This is white matter below, which we've left some white matter. And then this was an area where a seizure came from a little posteriorly, so we resected that as well. And this should really maximize her chances of never having another seizure again. So uh, I think she'll do great. So it's been three months since the surgery, and we're pleased to report the patient is doing extraordinarily well. She is completely seizure-free. She does not even feel any of the auras or the spells that led her to feel like she was going to have a seizure. This has completely changed her life. She's able to fully engage in functions, and one of the things that she says she's most excited about is now going to sleepovers. Her follow-up care includes seeing the neurosurgeons on a periodic basis and following up in our pediatric epilepsy clinic. Uh, we're pleased to see how well she's doing. She has no deficit on her examination. She does remain on medications, and we'll be following that for some time. But she really has a full and happy outcome for the future.